were just talking with Dennis a little bit about all these things that are going on in the financial market, different ways that maybe people can, uh, you know, uh, get get on the right path based on some things that may happen with the Fed. Now, when people are out looking to buy houses, of course, there are financial markets that are involved. There's a housing market that's involved. But there's also certain things that are within the house that I guess can be pretty dangerous, or I suppose if you handle it appropriately, could be not dangerous. Exactly. So uh, in past shows, we've talked about things that affect your financial health, but there's definitely a number of uh, toxins that can straight up affect your physical health. And definitely some of them absolutely cannot be present in the home under any circumstances. And some can be mitigated or handled correctly. And it's okay if they're in the home as long as they're encapsulated or mitigated in some way. Sure. So what are some of these toxins? Because, um, you know, I mean, there, there are toxins in a house. I mean, paint in some way is a toxin, but it's typically dried up on a wall. Right. Yeah, there's, there's actually a ton of toxins used to manufacture all the stuff we use. I mean, you wouldn't want to be in a carpet factory when they're making all the polyester using the resins and all that stuff. I mean, it would it would kill most people. So, uh, yeah, it's it's very much good to be aware of as much of this as you can. I mean, not so much that you don't sleep at night, but, you know, the you need a good short checklist. And the top of that is carbon monoxide. And actually, uh, it is now a new state requirement that carbon monoxide detectors be placed in any residential unit uh, during or prior to sale. Um and that's because uh, carbon monoxide is the leading cause of accidental poisonings uh, in the U.S. A thousand people die every year from carbon monoxide. Uh, I remember a few years back, somebody had a, a like a propane heater in their garage, and they were trying to heat up their house when, uh, you know, when the uh, it was very cold and the power went out. Yeah, it's a sad story, but you see a couple uh, examples every winter. Um, and, and here's why carbon monoxide is so toxic. It binds to hemoglobin, and hemoglobin, of course, is the carrier of oxygen to all of our cells, uh, our brain, heart, everything like that. So when you have this carbon monoxide with 200 times the binding power of atmospheric oxygen, it just takes over. Uh, Imagine a trucking system, and instead of this trucking system taking food to people, is now just carrying scrap or junk. So you have to keep... Uh, that trucking system going with all the critical stuff. And basically, carbon monoxide uh, can kill within a few hours or in the right concentration, probably kill in 10 minutes. So uh, a very critical thing to detect. Well, good good to know at least people are, you can have a carbon monoxide detector in your home. So it kind of goes back to that same fact. I mean, if you know it's put, uh, there's a possibility of something bad happening and you take the right measures to... You know, detect it, then you are certainly safer than without. Yeah, absolutely. And the good thing is carbon monoxide detectors are, are cheap. You can go to your local hardware store and you should put one in every level and you really need to follow the instructions to the letter. Uh, since gases ebb and flow, you need to place them in an ideal spot to, to help detect that. And sometimes you'll have a spike uh, in carbon monoxide. Let's say you're using a gas stove. Well, there will be in a usually high concentration of CO there, but it's a temporary thing. You should have the vent going for your stove, um, but you wouldn't want a detector too close to a stove. But you want it on each level, and you definitely want it in a basement where it's most likely to be found because of a natural gas furnace, propane furnace, uh, natural gas water heater. Those are the primary sources. What are some other big ones that, that people need to be aware of? And and at the end of this, I do want to get into how do people know if these things are in a house they may want to buy? Uh, overall toxins or the actual seal? Well, no, just what are some of the other big ones that are going on right now, the other big toxins people need to be aware of? Um, one of the most common ones that we encounter uh, within uh, residential sales is uh, lead-based paint. Mm-hmm. It's discussed all the time. And lead-based paint was used almost exclusively in uh, residential properties built prior to 1978. Um, So when you buy a home, you're going to get a lead-based paint disclosure for any home built prior to 1978 or a condo. And it's going to give you the opportunity to conduct a risk assessment. Well, my viewpoint on this has always been why pay a lab hundreds of dollars to test for lead when you should assume it's there? Because... 99.9% of these properties, they have lead-based paint in there. The hazard exists. It's just literally how do you handle it. And how do you handle it? I mean, that's the the one where, like, you really don't want your kids eating the paint chips. 
Truly, yeah, and uh, lead uh, affects uh, pregnant mothers and kids uh, uh, even more aggressively than adults. Not like adults want lead in their system. We can handle a certain dosage. Um, the bottom line is, is that lead, if it's not airborne, like asbestos, is not likely to be a hazard. Um, go to the EPA website. They have excellent information on how to handle lead-based paint. Um, usually lead-based paint is the biggest problem when you go to remove it. Um, so the so recommend- if it's just there, not a big deal, right? I mean, if it's just painted on there, it's been there since 1977, Right. It's probably like, okay, I mean, it's it's okay. It's when you decide that you all of a sudden want to scrape it off and repaint or something along those lines is really where you end up with these big problems. Exactly. The moment it's airborne, if you're dry sanding, that's inadvisable. Uh, the EPA recommends wet sanding. And absolutely, you want to use respiration um, and you want to do everything you can. I mean, there will be some dust, but you want to damp mop, do everything you can to keep that dust down. And also, some people use heat to remove lead-based paint, and that is a big issue. Uh, People have used propane torches. That immediately vaporizes the lead. Now you have lead vapor in the air, and now you're really in trouble. Um, So you definitely want to use... People torch their, like, walls to get the paint off? Yeah, that's an actual... It seems counterintuitive, doesn't it? Like, (laughs) okay, let's try to burn this paint off the house. I mean, people do that? Well, I mean, this is is something... Dennis is over there going, yeah, all the time. (laughs) This is something I have read about. I've not seen anyone uh, do something that unwise because clearly heat could just result in the loss of the house. Sure. <laughs> but you might have an insurance problem when you try to claim that. And they say, well, how'd your house burn down? I was blowtorching the walls. <laughs> right. <laughs> but people do use heat guns with a much lower um, you know, heat output uh, to remove the paint. The bottom line is if I bought a home with lead-based paint, I would paint over it, do as much prep as you can, and because when you buy a home built in, let's say, 1925, if you actually sand it through all the paint on there, you've got 12 layers of paint. It's kind of interesting colors through the years. But the bottom line is it's been sitting there. Keep it there. Mm-hmm. Um, Unless you're going for the, the full almost remodel type of position, in which case you would obviously remove it. Yeah. At that point, you're going to have to comply with city and county standards, and they don't mess around with that. So it just know when you wonder why your remodel is more expensive than you thought, part of that has to do with these contractors, licensed contractors that you hire, have to meet city and county standards for handling lead paint. So if you paint over lead paint, let's say like, I don't know, like a latex paint, I mean, I guess that's kind of entrapping the bad stuff behind another layer of safer paint. Is that a fair thing to say? You nailed it. Uh, encapsulation is the key. Uh, same with asbestos. You absolutely want that stuff encapsulated. Anything, any other big uh, big things out there, Michael, that people are, are I guess, should be a- aware of? Because if you're going in, you're buying a house, you're ready to make these big decisions, especially in this current market where people are running around, hair on fire, willing to do anything to get a house. These, these are maybe things that people overlook because, well, you know, you can't see or smell a lot of these toxins that maybe are there. Uh, anything else you can really think of that, that maybe people could overlook that they really shouldn't? Oh, yeah. Uh, there's a number of things. Um, in fact, this is all, there's almost enough to this topic. We could have a two-part show. But asbestos is the next one on the list. Um, I, I focus on this a lot because I sell a lot of older homes in Seattle. You're not going to see asbestos much at all um, in, in the 1980s, 1990s homes. Um, but you will find it in several places on older homes. Uh, the first one, the most common one I see is the tape, asbestos tape they use to wrap ductwork. And it looks like, so just so you know, uh, and you can do an image search online, um, definitely helpful, definitely advisable, but it looks like medical gauze. It's a little off-white in color. Sometimes it's just a simple stripe of tape around the joint where the ducts meet, and sometimes you'll have an old radiator, uh, a boiler for radiators that is encapsulated in this stuff, and it is inches thick. Um, When you have a small amount of this tape, and it's not fraying or coming apart, they definitely advise you encapsulate it. And literally, you just take some heavy white latex paint, soak it, let it dry, and you're fine. But there are some examples of asbestos that are too excessive. And if you see a home with radiator heat, that's your warning. A lot of those pipes are just coated in this stuff. You may have to have professional remediation, and now you're looking at a low five-figure bill to do that properly. And that can get expensive quick, especially if you're using your money for your down payment. 
Oh, a- absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, even though it's a uh, wild multiple offer market out there, you do want to take your time. It's worth it to pre-inspect. Even if you get out bad, you know, it's only 350 400 don't, bucks. Don't let the market literally kill you. R- tr- truly. By, yeah. <laughs> by, by buying something that can kill you. Yeah, it's it's okay to be mildly financially unwise to make sure you are uh, wise with these toxins. I, I would agree with that. Michael, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, do you have one more quick thing? Oh, yeah. I just was going to mention, uh, you may hear of radon. Uh, radon uh, is very rare in western Washington. It only occurs in places with a heavy granite base, a few spots in Tacoma. But I've actually never heard of anything in 15 years in the business in King County. So uh, radon can be detected. Uh, if you're worried about it, you can buy a radon detection kit. But uh, just know that that's much more common in the Midwest and back east. 